we have Dr. Steve Meyer with us today. Um, I'm so excited uh, that he is here. I've uh, been telling you about his coming for the last several weeks. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about Steve. Uh, he is the director of the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. Um, he's an amazing scientist. He's an amazing philosopher. Um, but even more important, you need to know that even though he has a, a, a Ph.D. from Cambridge University, uh, more than anything, he loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is a brother in Christ. And he is passionate about using science and, and study, studying the creation um, to, to show that God is alive. And um, that, that, that's an important truth in this day of the new atheists where there seems to be sweeping across our world a new, a, a new denial of the very existence of God. Um, we have asked Steve to come today as part of our next step series as, as we're seeking as a church and as a spiritual family to get unstuck spiritually. And one of the ways we feel like we can get unstuck is to, is to be reintroduced again to the beauty and the wonder of the scientific evidence for God. And so Steve is with us this morning. He is brilliant, uh, but he is a precious brother in Christ. He's married to Elaine. He has three children, Jamie, Bethan, and Matthew. And uh, I, I would just advise you right now, fasten your seatbelt and uh, welcome with me my friend, Dr. Stephen Meyer. In 2006, there started a publishing phenomenon phenoms in the publishing world. A new genre broke into the publishing world called the New Atheism. Uh, there was a series of books, the most famous of which was Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. Um, others, Breaking the Spell by Daniel Dennett, where the spell was religious belief. God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchin. Letter to uh, the, a, a Christian Nation by Sam Harris. And these books had a common message. And the message was that if you understand the scientific world, if you understand science, if you understand nature, you'll realize that there's really no evidence for God. And in fact, it makes a lot more sense to be an atheist. Um, Richard Dawkins' uh, book unpacked the argument like this. He said, uh, prior to Darwin, the strongest argument for believing in the existence of God was the evidence of design that we see in the natural world, publicly accessible scientific evidence. But since Darwin, we've learned that there is no actual design in nature, only the appearance or the illusion of design. Why the illusion? Well, because we know there's an unguided, undirected process known as natural selection, acting on random variations and mutations, which can produce the appearance of design without being designed or guided in any way. The mechanism of natural selection mimics the powers of a designing intelligence, according to standard Darwinian thought. And so there is no evidence of design and therefore no evidence of a designer. Dawkins says, well, we haven't conclusively disproven the existence of God, but we have rendered belief in God so, science has rendered belief in God so incredibly improbable as to make belief in God effectively delusional. And that's his, that's his famous argument. Now, at the Discovery Institute where I work, we have a lot of interaction with young people, young people going into the sciences, young people reading our stuff. Uh, I used to be a college professor as well. And I know that these arguments are having a lot of traction in the culture, uh, certainly with younger people in particular. Uh, we, we have fielded a lot of questions about them, and I know they are very troubling to young people, not only because they deny faith, but also because they seem to deny the possibility of any purpose to human existence. You can't have a purpose-driven life if there isn't a purpose beyond the universe. Uh, and so we've, we've actually had some very... Um, poignant conversations, not only with young people, and in one case with a father of a, a bereaved father of a young person who uh, committed suicide after reading one of these books. Uh, he had been a Christian. He found himself unable to answer the arguments. He ended up losing his faith, losing hope, and uh, they found the book, The God Delusion, under his bed after they found the body. Uh, so some of this is very, uh, this is a dramatic story, but uh, a true one. The young man's name was Jesse Kilgore. Uh, so these books are having a big influence in the culture with young people in particular. When we send kids off to college and they lose their faith in their first year, part of the reason is they're encountering this kind of a perspective. 
the perspective, though, is not just limited to um, young people. It's also affected our cultural elites. Um, I was actually saddened about a month ago to learn that George Will, a person whom I have a great admiration for, uh, acknowledged in an interview that he was an atheist. And one of the reasons for that, he said, is there just no evidence, no evidence, uh, no scientific evidence for the, for, for the existence of God. And so this is a, a powerful perspective that's out there in the culture. Now, <clears throat> you won't be surprised to learn that the perspective of the new atheist is diametrically opposed, oh my goodness, uh, to, <laughs> Andy's very pastoral, reassuring me that I haven't like, put the church on fire. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, this perspective is diametrically opposed, obviously, to the, the perspective of the Bible. If you go back to the Hebrew Bible, to the Tanakh, you find in the Psalms the affirmation that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. The idea there is that there's something about nature that points to the reality of the mind, the creator behind it. You find the same perspective in the New Testament where Paul says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood, and this is, the, I think, the key words, from what has been made. When you look at the natural world, when you look at what has been made, Paul affirms that you, should be, you, sh, you are seeing evidence of the reality of God and of his divine attributes, his power and his, is, is, in the NIV it says the, the, his divine nature and some of the older translations translated that phrase in his wisdom. And <clears throat> so, not surprising, the Bible and the New Atheists uh, disagree. But what you may find surprising is that the new atheists are actually also, stand, their, their perspective stands in stark contrast to the perspective of the scientists who got modern science going, the founders of what historians of science call modern science, early modern science. Uh, this is a front piece or a uh, title page from one of the first great works of biology in the 17th century, uh, published by John Ray. And the title, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation, in two parts, it's a big book, um, is actually a paraphrase from the passage of the book of Romans that I just read a minute ago. The early scientists had a word, an important word, uh, a watchword, if you will, and the word was intelligibility. They believed that nature was intelligible, that it could be understood by the rational intellect of the human mind because the mind of man had been made in the image of the mind of God who had created the world. So there was a principle of correspondence. God had built rationality and order and structure and design into the world, but he'd also made our minds in a way that could understand it. Thus, nature was intelligible, and thus it made sense to study nature in a systematic way because nature had secrets to reveal that would be revealed if we studied nature closely. Now, that was an assumption that gave rise to modern science. But as scientists in that period studied nature, they also thought that they were finding evidence of design in nature. Now, a couple years ago, I had an opportunity to testify before a group called the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And they were investigating the question of whether or not there was viewpoint discrimination in the discussion of biological origins in the public schools. Now, when I heard what they were investigating, I thought, I wouldn't think you would need a hearing to establish that. If you open a biology textbook, there's only one perspective presented. It's the Darwinian view of biological origins, and there aren't even in the biological textbooks any mention of the scientific criticisms of Darwinian theory, which are now everywhere in the scientific literature, including in the field of evolutionary biology. And I'll talk a lot more about that tonight in my seminar. But in any case, I was called to testify before this hearing, and they wanted to know, the commissioners wanted to know about my perspective, my advocacy for the theory of intelligent design, and wanted to know if there was viewpoint discrimination against that perspective. I argued, of course, that there is. And when I got done making my testimony, one of the commissioners began to, to uh, ask me a series of questions. They, they felt a little bit interrogative, and I had the sense that he was trying to impeach my credibility. He asked where I'd gone to college, what, uh, where I'd done my, my PhD, did my supervisors in Cambridge know of this disreputable position that I held, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was the, the, the uh, uh, standard impeachment strategy that lawyers use. But that at a certain point in the, in the questioning, 
he seemed to take a different tack that was much more friendly. And he started to ask me about the theory of intelligent design. And at one point he said, now isn't this theory of intelligent design that you favor essentially the same perspective that was advanced by the early founders of science itself, like Kepler and Galileo and Sir Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle? And when I heard the names of my heroes, my, my spirit brightened. And I realized, well, maybe this guy isn't so hostile after all. And so I gave a little discourse about, uh, about yes, you know, absolutely, this is exactly what Kepler and Newton and Boyle in particular uh, discussed quite frequently. At that point, my opposite number in the hearing had had enough and quickly interjected and said, well, what Dr. Meyer is saying is true as far as it goes. It's true that Sir Isaac Newton was very religious, but he took great pains to keep his religious ideas about intelligent design out of any discussion in, the, in his works of science, to keep his religion and his science separate. Notice how she defined intelligent design as a religious idea. Now, I'm not one of these people that uh, memorizes passages of text or even Bible verses very readily. I just, it's just not me. But at that time, I happened to have in my briefcase an essay I'd finished in the last few days wherein I had a big quote from Sir Isaac Newton on the first page. And I had it virtually committed to memory. I actually think it's a wonderful quotation. And, it's, <clears throat> and I found myself saying something in the hearing that sounded very impressive. See if you agree. <laughs> I said, well, actually, that's not true. Sir Isaac Newton, in the general scolium to the Principia, <laughs> general scolium just means introduction, but never mind. I said, in the general scolium to the Principia, Newton argued uh, <clears throat> that, um, uh, I said, in the general scolium to the Principia, arguably, one of the greatest works of physics ever written, Newton argued as follows. And then I gave a, a, a rough paraphrase of this quotation, and I want to read it to you. Here's the background. Newton was talking about the origin of the solar system. The Principia is the great work where he laid out his theory of gravitational force. And he explained in the, in the introduction that gravitational force was obviously the force that was at work everywhere and always in the universe, but it didn't explain the origin of the solar system. Because the forces, of, the gravitational forces between the different planets were so exquisitely balanced to allow them to have a stable orbit that, there, that the only explanation for that was something beyond just the mere force of gravity. And here's how he puts it. Though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have first derived the regular position of those orbits from the laws themselves. Thus this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being, capital B. And so I said, actually, it's not true. His case for intelligent design was built into his greatest scientific works. Now, at that point in the hearing, it got rather interesting. A number of the commissioners suddenly smiled and started nodding, like, well, this could be more interesting than we thought. So uh, in any case, that raises a question. How did we get from Newton to Dawkins, where the, our perception of what science shows about the big worldview questions is, is now diametrically opposite. Newton was clearly a theist and a Christian of a kind, and many of his, his colleagues at the time were really uh, orthodox Christians, and now we have this new atheism. Well, there's a long story, and it starts mainly in the 19th century, where there was a big shift in the, what you might call the philosophy of science or the worldview that seemed to flow out of science. Started in the early part of the 19th century, there was a book written by a French scientist named Pierre Laplace. It was called The Celestial Mechanics. And Laplace attempted to do exactly what Newton said you could not do, which was explain the origin of the solar system by reference to purely undirected processes all by themselves. And after he had published the book, the French emperor Napoleon called uh, Laplace into the palace to receive commendation, probably mainly because he had shown up the British. And um, he was talking, and this is a, a story that's told by historians that tell this. They're not sure if it actually happened. It may be apocryphal, but it definitely captures the spirit of the 19th century. And Napoleon is, is said to have asked Laplace the following question. I, I read Isaac Newton, said Napoleon. I've I understand that he talks about God on nearly every page of his books, but you don't mention God at all. Why? And Laplace is said to have puffed himself up and said, Sire, I have no need of that hypothesis. That's my French accent. 
Um, I know, it's not very good. Uh, and this statement seemed to typify what would come throughout the rest of the 19th century. There was no need of the design hypothesis, no need, therefore, of a designer, no need of God. And there were many other theories in the 19th century that had this same character, accounting for the origin of very big features of our universe and of, of life itself without any, any reference to a designing intelligence or creator of any kind. In, uh, most of us are familiar, familiar with Darwin's theory of evolution. And in a major college biology text that's used today in many colleges and universities, in the introduction, there is a statement from the author, Douglas Fatuma. And Fatuma says that by coupling the undirected, purposeless pro variations to the blind, uncaring process of natural selection, Darwin made theological explanations of life superfluous, unnecessary. He had no need of the design hypothesis. In fact, Darwin thought he was refuting the design hypothesis. Other theories in the 19th century extended this way of thinking. There were scientists who came along and explained uh, uh, where the very first life had come from, something Darwin didn't attempt to explain. He only attempted to explain where new species came from, assuming that you had at least a simple cell to begin with. There, Darwin himself extended his theory by talking about, in his second book, The Descent of Man, explaining where the human species had come from. And so by the end of the 19th century, it was possible to paint a kind of seamless story of the history of the universe, starting with the solar system and going right through the major geological features, the origin of the first life, the origin of new species, the origin of human life, and all those events could be accounted for, so it was thought, as the result of undirected, unguided material processes without any reference to a designing agent or intelligence of any kind. And so that gave rise not just to a series of theories, if you'll pardon the rhyme, but a philosophy or a worldview that scientists and philosophers and scholars call scientific materialism or sometimes scientific naturalism. Now, how many are familiar with the term worldview? Okay, very good. Um, if it were a slightly smaller audience, I'd ask you the rhetorically, well, how would you define it? But since we're bigger, I'll, I'll, I'll define it myself. A worldview is something like a personal philosophy or a more or less coherent uh, set of answers to the basic questions about reality. It's not a question about who's going to win the cowboy game today or uh, who will win the election next Tuesday or what the formula for salt is. Questions more like uh, what is the thing or the entity or the process from which everything else comes? In fact, the most important question that every worldview has to answer is precisely that question about origins. Where did everything come from? Now, when I was a college student, uh, I did a science major. I did physics and geology. And part of the reason for my um, focus and interest in science was the influence of my father. He's a, he's a mechanical engineer, a very smart guy with math and science. And before I set out for college, he gave me some very stern fatherly advice. He said, look, I know you don't want to be a mechanical engineer. It's obvious you'd always drop the wrench inside the uh, engine when we're working. Um, but he said, you know, and you don't have to follow in my footsteps, but he said it's very important when you set out for university to make sure you take at least two years of college math. Because if you don't have the math, you're going to be, you're going to be limited in, in what you can major in. So I said, well, okay, sure, Dad. That's, and that's what I did. I took two years of math. But I was at a small college, and when you got done taking two years of math, about the only thing you could major in besides math was physics, which is about as close to engineering as you can get in a small college. And so I think that's what my dad wanted all along. <laughs> he had some design himself in mind. So um, anyway, one, the problem was I was interested in these big philosophical questions. And there was a wonderful philosophy professor who was a mentor in my life named Norman Krebs who taught these great philosophy questions or classes that got to the heart of the matter. And was, he was often looking at comparative worldviews, whole systems of thought and how they differed. And so every semester I'd sneak across campus and sign up for at least one Norman Krebs philosophy class. And in my junior year, I was taking this class called Atheistic Existentialism. It's the philosophy of, the, of Camus and Sartre and Nietzsche, the God is dead, um, atheistic existential uh, despair. And I was, uh, I was wallowing in despair. I was, I, was ex I was doing exceedingly well at it, and I got an A in this class in existential despair. And <clears throat> uh, my grade slip came home at, at Christmas time, and uh, my dad was still in the, he, he, we're a Germanic background, and he's got the Germanic work ethic, so he was still intercepting grade slips in, for his college students, you know. And so at, over dinner one night, he got it out, and he said, I want to talk to you about a few things. 
And so he, he got out his glasses and, and was reading the grades off one by one. And he started with atheistic, atheistic, exa, atheistic, ex, what in the blank he says is atheistic existentialism. And, and, uh, and then he read the grade and he said, A. And then he read the next grade and it was theoretical mechanics, which was my most important physics uh, class in the semester. And he, there was a pause and then he read the grade and I winced and it said, B. And then there was lo the, a look over the, at the top of the glasses that everyone in all the kids in our family knew meant, it is now time for a child to give an account of child's behavior. <laughs> and so I started, I got real defensive and I said, dad, 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 look, I know, I know these philosophy classes don't mean anything to you, but, but they're really important because they help you understand where people are coming from. They help you understand people's worldviews. And dad, look, I, everybody has a worldview, whether they know it or not. And a, and a worldview is, it, it, it's a basic set of, and he's cut me off. He said, son, you don't need a worldview. You need a job. <laughs> now, I, I noticed that some of the fathers are, are actually not so appalled at this statement. You know, they, and, uh, and as a father now, I can, I can appreciate my dad's perspective. But uh, it, it is the case, nevertheless, that worldviews are important. And it, to understand what's going on in our culture today, we really do need to understand the default worldview, especially of our elite knowledge culture, uh, are the, the, the universities, the science departments, the media elite, um, the law schools, the courts, even the seminaries are affected by the worldview I was talking about a minute ago. In fact, I think it's the default worldview of these elite institutions in our culture, people in those institutions. They may not know where, they came from, where it came from or why it's so persuasive, but it's what all the smart people seem to be thinking. And the worldview has a name. It's called naturalism, or it's called materialism, or the scholars call it scientific materialism or scientific naturalism because it is allegedly supported by science. And the worldview runs something like this. It answers that big, important first question, what is the thing or the entity or the process from which everything else came, in very simple terms. It says that the thing or the entity or the process from which everything else came is material. It's matter and energy. Uh, I have a, a law professor friend named Philip Johnson out at the University of California, Berkeley. He's now emeritus. And he uh, has been interested in this issue of, of origins for a long time. And he, he paraphrases the materialistic worldview by reference to uh, the, the, the book of John, where it says, in the beginning was the word, or Genesis, where it says, in the beginning God said. The theistic worldview says that there was a great omniscient creator who has a mind, who brought the material, material universe into existence and then shaped it. The materialistic worldview says just the opposite, that not in the beginning, but from eternity past, there was this eternal, self-existent material state. From eternity past were the particles. And the particles became complex stuff, complex chemicals. And those chemicals arranged themselves into the first life by purely undirected material processes. And the first life then evolved further by Darwinian processes to form all the forms of life we see today. And one of those forms of life evolved eventually to the state where it could conceive of or get the idea of a supreme being, of God. And so in the materialistic worldview, there is the concept of God, but God only exists as a concept. It's matter first, and God is a concept at the end of the process. Whereas in the theistic worldview, it's God first, then matter, and matter is shaped to become all the things we see. The two perspectives could not be more different and they are vying for allegiance in our culture today. That's what a lot of the disagreements about, when you trace disagreements about the sanctity of life, for example, back to their root, it comes to these underlying assumptions about what the nature of life is and what the nature of ultimate reality is. So this, this, is, a, 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 this is what's at work. Now, the bad news I have to report this morning, if you happen to be here as a believer in God, as a theist, of some kind, is that this materialistic, naturalistic view is the dominant worldview in the culture. And increasingly, people who have a theistic worldview are being pushed to the margins of the culture. One of the reasons that students go off to college and in the freshman year lose their faith in incredible numbers is they're encountering that worldview as the dominant way of thinking among all the smart people that they're looking to for guidance, advice, and who are teaching their classes. They feel like they didn't get the memo. And, and so it's, it's a real challenge to people of faith. Uh, 
Now, th this little diagram behind me actually is just a, a way of depicting the materialistic worldview. The, di the, the physical or the circle represents the physical world. The pendulum represents the laws of nature. And the, the guy being bumped by it is to indicate that even we are completely determined by our, our genes and our environment by these purely materialistic forces. That's the materialistic worldview. And then the Godbuster sign there, or the Ghostbuster sign, is to indicate that in the materialistic worldview, there is no need of that hypothesis. No need to postulate God to explain anything at all. Now, that's, in a sense, the bad news if you're a theist. And I'm going to pivot because there's some really amazing news. The materialistic worldview was formed in the 19th century. Key figures, Darwin told us where we came from. Marx told us what to do about our guilt. Freud had a utopian vision of the future. Between the three, the, just these three great thinkers, they answered all the questions that traditional Judeo-Christian religion has answered. But there's been a major shift in science. Whereas this worldview is allegedly based on science, there have been a series of discoveries in the 20th century that have decidedly anti-materialistic implications. Indeed, I think they have theistic implications, and I want to explain why. The change started in the 19-teens and 20s. And, and the shift, the intellectual shift, started in the field of astronomy and cosmology. And one of the key figures in that shift is a famous astronomer named Edwin Hubble. He came into the field of astronomy from, from, from law at a very propitious time. It was just as the astronomers were building these great domed telescopes. And as a result of these telescopes, the astronomers, and this is a picture of Hubble working at his, at, at his workstation within one of the, the telescopes, they were able for the first time to resolve these tiny points of light in the night sky. During the early part of the 20th century, astronomers still debated whether or not the, our, our galaxy, the Milky Way, was the only galaxy. But as they resolved these little tiny points of light, they also resolved that question. Because it turned out that some of these points of light weren't just star, distant stars. They were these gigantic clusters of stars that we call galaxies. And these are some of Hubble's initial photographic plates. This is a, spin, a spiral nebula. Uh, and the previous one is a spindle nebula. And as he surveyed the night sky, he began to see that in, in whatever quadrant of the sky he looked, there were galaxies galore. And it began to give him a sense of the great immensity of the universe. Focus, if you could, for just a minute on the little tiny square in this visual field of the night sky. And you see where the arrow is pointing. That little square now I'm going to amp, I'm going to magnify. And as you see, even in that little tiny quadrant of the sky with sufficient magnification, there are, are galaxies and galaxies and galaxies. And so the first great conclusion that came from this new investigation of the night sky was that the universe is vast and vast beyond any measure that we had ever conceived before. But then there was another discovery that was made by Hubble that had both theoretical significance for cosmology and deeper worldview significance or implications. And that had to do with the light that was coming from these distant galaxies. It would, the light was shifted in the, to the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. It was redder than it would otherwise be. Otherwise, here's what I mean. The, what he discovered was the galaxies are moving away from us. And as a result of that, the, 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 light was, the light coming from the galaxies was stretched out. You may be familiar with this effect uh, as a result of um, sound. You've heard of the Doppler, the Doppler shift? If a, if a train is moving away from us, what happens to the pitch of the, of the sound, of the whistle? It goes down, hmm, okay. We actually have a, I don't know if I can talk about this in church, but we have a beer commercial up in Seattle um, where the guys are riding around on motorbikes and they're, they, they're saying, uh, Ray near beer as they're moving away, you know. So you have the 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 Doppler shift affecting the beer advertisement. Never mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> same thing is happening. Light. That's the point. I almost lost the thread there. Okay. And uh, so because the, the the galaxies are moving away, we're seeing the red the the light stretched out in its wavelength, which corresponds to a redder hue as as the light is is detected. And this gave rise to the conclusion that the universe is actually expanding. If all the galaxies are moving away from us, that's because the universe itself is expanding. And so let me, I brought a visual aid to illustrate. As you go forward in the forward direction of time, the galaxies are getting further and further away, which means the, expand, which means the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
But now think in your mind's eye. Imagine you're one of those Saturday, remember those Saturday morning cartoons where they wind the clock backwards? Back extrapolate, as the scientists say. You go back 100 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 years or a billion years or however far you want to go back, and eventually the expansion has to begin. If it's expanding outward now, as you back it up, there had to be a beginning. And if there was a beginning to the expansion, there may well have been a beginning to the universe. Now, <clears throat> this was a very troubling conclusion to a lot of scientists. And there was a scientist out in Princeton, across the country from Hubble, a very famous scientist with bad hair that you may have heard of, named Einstein. And Albert Einstein had already come to the conclusion through his work in physics, uh, particularly his theory of general relativity, which was a theory of gravity. His idea was that, that as, if there were massive bodies, they would actually curve space, create a curved gravitational field. And as he began to think of it, he realized that, that his theory implied that the universe was expanding outward from an initial beginning point. And that really troubled him. And because he didn't like the conclusion, because it actually seemed to contradict this philosophy of materialism, which at that time he was very sympathetic to, he postulated another force at work that would balance the force of expansion so that you would have a perfect, perfectly static universe. This force was called the cosmological constant, and he gave it a value that would make everything work out. So the force of expansion and the force of gravity pulling things back would be exactly balanced. So you'd have this static universe with no beginning and no end. And he felt a lot better about that. The only problem was that the heavens talked back. And when Hubble learned about what Einstein was doing and what his initial conclusion was, that there was an expanding universe in the beginning, he invited him out to California to see the evidence of precisely that. And there's some famous newsreel footage of Einstein with Hubble and some other astronomers at the uh, Palomar Observatory at Mount Wilson in Pasadena, California. And the, here's Einstein looking through the telescope. And after he has his look, he comes out and addresses the media in his heavy German accent. And he says, I now see the necessity of a beginning. And he later says that his cosmological constant, his fudge factor, was the greatest, scientific, uh, the greatest mistake of his scientific career. He didn't allow the evidence to dictate his conclusion. He had a philosophical prejudice. Now, what was the problem? Why was this so distressing? Well, there were, other, there were other scientists who shared Einstein's prejudice, and they came up with other theories to try to get around the idea that there was a definite beginning. One of those scientists was Arthur Eddington, a prominent British uh, astrophysicist. And I want to read you his, his proposal. He says, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. I simply do not believe the present order of things started off with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous. It leaves me cold. Now, in psychology, this theory is known as denial. <laughs> do you notice the first word of the quotation? Yes, philosophically, he doesn't like it. It's not that the evidence shows that there was not a beginning. It's that it... It contradicts a philosophy that he's held in advance. And that philosophy is, again, materialism. And a later physicist, a number of years later, Robert Dickey at Princeton, explained what, why this was such a big deal. He said, an infinitely old universe relieves us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter, the cause of the origin of matter, at any finite time in the past. If matter itself comes into existence, if the universe begins at a certain point, we have to think about what caused the universe, which something be separate from or beyond the universe would need to be its cause, logically speaking. And that suggests some kind of transcendent cause, and that's getting awfully close to the notion of a creator. Now, as if to underscore this conclusion, a few years later, in 1968, two British physicists, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking. Hawking, the famous Cambridge physicist who's confined to a wheelchair, who has the Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and, and they uh, worked, did some further work on Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, his theory of gravity. And they solved something called the field equations of general relativity. And Andy will be giving a quiz on that after I'm done. Uh, anyway, it's some heavy math, and you know, it's not something that we can just 
derive here. But the conclusion was interesting, and I think you can understand it intuitively. They showed that as you go back in time, further and further and further, the, the mass of the universe would be more and more concentrated. Because in Einstein's theory of gravity, mass is causing, causing space to curve, as you go back far enough, there's going to be a point where the mass is so densely concentrated that it's going to cause an infinitely tight curvature. At some point in the finite past, you're get the, the, the space of the universe will be effectively zero. The curvature will be so tight that it corresponds to zero spatial volume. And that raises a huge question. How much stuff or matter can you put in no space? The, the correct answer is none. You're right. I mean, that's what you wanted to say. I know. Okay. And so the, 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 the picture of the early universe that is, that is created by this profound theory in modern physics is one that is not dissimilar to the, the, the medieval doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing physical. And as a result of this discovery, the, the, the new cosmology, these discoveries in physics, there's been a, a whole lot of discussion among philosophers about reviving the ancient cosmological argument, the idea that there must be a first cause beyond the universe to bring the universe into existence. Uh, in the Q&A tonight after my seminar, I'd be happy to discuss some of the different objections to this argument and, and the standing of it, but it's been a big shift in our intellectual landscape, and I think it has decidedly, decidedly theistic implications. Um, in fact, it affirms the very first words of the Bible, in the beginning. It affirms there was a beginning. Uh, and even in the New Testament, there's a discussion of how God's plan exists from before the beginning of time. Odd that the scripture would affirm that time itself has a beginning. It's precisely what modern physics is telling us as well. Time and space, matter and energy all begin in a singularity a finite time ago. Now, in addition to the developments in cosmology, there's some very striking developments in physics that I think have anti-materialistic and decidedly theistic implications. And one of those developments is something called the fine-tuning, the anthropic fine-tuning. The idea is that there are certain um, features of the universe, certain attributes of the universe, uh, the, the, what physicists talk about, the laws and constants of physics that are delicately balanced to allow for the possibility of life. We live in a kind of Goldilocks universe where things are, uh, where, where forces are not too strong or not too weak. This expansion rate of the universe that I was talking about is, is finely tuned to one part in 10 to the 60th power. That's like one dollar out of a trillion, 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 trillion dollars. Now, not very much by reference to the federal budget deficit, I grant you, but this is incredible fine-tuning. If any engineers here may be uh, familiar with the concept of tolerances, this is like getting it exactly right within very, with very small margin for error. And there are numerous factors like this. Uh, one physicist has uh, used an illustration of a universe-creating machine, and he asked you to think about all the dials and knobs responsible for generating our universe. And, he, and the, he says, the point is, every dial, every knob, every slider has an exact setting in order to make life possible. The expansion rate of the universe was a little faster, a little slower. We'd either get a big crunch, a gravitational collapse, or a heat death, where everything is dissipated and no possibility in either case of life existing. So in response to these discoveries in physics, many physicists have been entertaining the idea of design, of intelligent design. One of the great British uh, Australian physicists, Sir, uh, Fred Hoyle at Cambridge, uh, said when some of these things were first being discovered, he said, a common sense interpretation of the, of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology to make life possible. Yeah, I, I always like the way the monkeys get into these origins discussions, <laughs> even in physics. Um, in addition, there are, uh, to, to physics and cosmology, there have been some extraordinary discoveries in biology, and these, I think, are in some ways the most exciting of all. Uh, inside cells, in the last 30 years, we've been discovering little tiny miniature machines, nanotechnology, sliding clamps, rotary engines, little turbines, robotic walking motor proteins that are towing vesicles of material through a kind of maze of a labyrinth of tracks to get things in the right place. It's just an unbelievably mechanized system on the inside of the cell. And one of my colleagues, Michael Behe, uh, 
a biochemist from Lehigh University and also a fellow of the Discovery Institute, has made a number of these machines famous, in particular something called the bacterial flagellar motor. It's a little rotary engine with rotor and a stator and U-joints and bushings and a drive shaft. It rotates at 100,000 RPM in some bacterial systems, can change directions on a quarter of a turn, and it's hardwired into something called a signal transduction circuitry that allows the little bacterium to detect what's going on around it. It's an incredible piece of nanotechnology in an incredibly simple, otherwise simple organism, a bacterium. It's high tech and low life. And Behe has argued that these pieces of nanotechnology have an attribute he calls irreducible complexity that provides powerful evidence for a designing intelligence at work. I won't recapitulate his argument. You can read about it in his great book, Darwin's Doubt, but partly because I want to talk about the part of this uh, discussion that I work on, which is not just the machinery, but the information, the instructions, the digital code that's necessary to build these tiny nanomachines that we find inside cells. I used to ask my students a question. If you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? What would you say? Software? Code? Instructions? All of those are the right answer. Well, the great discovery of modern biology is that the same thing is true of life. If you want to build a new, um, a new animal or a new molecular machine, you have to have information. Uh, put your, can you see that U-joint in the bacterial flagellar motor picture I've got? It's a little animation still there. Now, notice the next slide. It's the same structure, but notice that the U-joint is a, it's made of a, it's a protein that makes that big part, that structural part in the molecule. But all proteins are made of simpler subunits called amino acids. And amino acids are, are, form long chain-like molecules. There are 20 different kinds of protein-forming amino acids. And to form a protein, you have to have the amino acids in the right order. If they're in the right sequence, then it sets up a constellation of forces that causes the chain to fold into a particular three-dimensional shape. And this raises a big question. And if the shape is right, it'll perform a function. In this case, it functions as a U-joint in a motor. Okay? Now, that raises a big question, and that is, how does the cell know how to arrange its amino acids so that they are arranged properly to form the structures that the cell needs to stay alive? And the answer to that, I think, is the most, has to do with the most incredible discovery of 20th century science. And that is that there is actually inside the cell a molecule that stores information in a digital form that the inf information or instructions for building those proteins. It actually tells the cell how to arrange all those amino acids so they fold properly to make those, those amazing intricate parts. And that molecule that has the information that is directing the construction of those mechanical parts is called DNA. Most of us have heard of it, right? Um, and DNA, the structure of DNA was discovered in 1953. But in 1957, there was an even more profound um, insight, and that came from Francis Crick. He was the co-discoverer of the structure. But in 1953, he put forward something called the sequence hypothesis. DNA has an interesting structure. It's a double helix, and on the outside of the helix, there's something called the sugar phosphate backbone. But on the inside of the helix, there are, there's another kind of chemical called a base, or a nucleotide base, and there's four different types of them. And Crick proposed that those four bases are functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters, the zeros and ones that we use in software. In other words, it's not the physical properties of the chemicals that matter to the function of DNA. It's their arrangement in accord with a code such that the molecule is actually storing encoded digital information for building all the protein parts and machines that we need to stay alive, that every cell needs to stay alive. And so that raises a huge question. And that question is this, where did the information come from? Where did all that code come from? There's one scientist who said this very clearly, he says the problem of the origin of life is basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of the information because we know you need the information to build the cells and to build the animals. Now, I first encountered this idea in 1985, actually right here in Dallas. I was working as a geophysicist for one of the major oil companies in town, and a conference came to town investigating the big questions at the intersection between science and philosophy. It was perfect for me. 
And there was a scientist at the conference named Charles Thaxton who had just written a book called The Mystery of Life's Origin. And it was all about how very difficult it is to explain where we get the very first cell from in the first place. Uh, the problem turns out to be a profound one. How do you get from chemistry to code? And no one working in this field called origin of life studies had been able to figure it out. And so he wrote a book critiquing these theories of chemical evolution that attempt to explain the origin of the first life. But in the epilogue to his book, he floated a very radical proposal. He said, not only do these materialistic theories not work, he said, maybe we're looking at evidence for an intelligent cause. Because intuitively, intelligence is a kind of mind product. It's the thing we just know. It comes from minds. And so I got to meet Thaxton. I missed a lot of dinners my first year of marriage because we'd talk way too long. And he kind of mentored me. And a year later, I was off to grad school to England. And I had a burning question in my mind. And that was, could this intuitive connection between mind and information be developed into a rigorous scientific argument for the design hypothesis? Could we revive the idea of intelligent design having a scientific basis on the basis of these discoveries of the information bearing properties of DNA? And oddly, ironically perhaps, when I got to grad school, I began to study very carefully the works of Charles Darwin because he was not only known for his theory of evolution, he was also known for having pioneered a special method of scientific investigation, a method that was more forensic or historical. Darwin was trying to explain what caused events in the remote past. But he knew that you couldn't go back to the ancient past and cause those events to happen all over again in, a, in controlled laboratory conditions. So you had to kind of reason more like a detective to figure out what caused those events. And he pioneered a method that's known as inferring or inference to the best explanation, or sometimes called the method of multiple competing hypotheses. And, the method, and his method raised a question. What does it mean to be the best explanation of an event a long time ago? And as I was investigating that question, I came across uh, a helpful answer in one of the scientists who had mentored Darwin. And he said, when we're trying to explain an, an event in the remote past, we should be looking for causes that are known from our present experience, from our uniform and repeated experience, to have the capacity to produce the event we're trying to explain. And he had a phrase. He said, we should be looking for causes now in operation. And then the nickel dropped for me. Because I began to think, what is the cause now in operation for the production of digital information? What is the cause that we know of from our uniform and repeated experience that always produces information? And about that time, I also came across a passage in a, in a, in a scientist who was a studying how information theory and information concepts applied to the DNA molecule. And he made an offhand comment that caused another light to go on for me. He said, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Whenever we see information, it's always come from a mind. And I thought, could that be true? Because if it is, then using Darwin's own method of scientific reasoning leads you to the conclusion that a mind was involved in the origin of life. And as I thought about it more, I thought, well, I think this is true. Mind or information always does come from a mind. Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a computer program, but much more complex than any we've ever designed. What do we know about computer programs? They always come from programmers. In fact, whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. Whether we're looking at hieroglyphic inscriptions on the Rosetta Stone or headlines in a newspaper, or paragraphs in a book, or even information embedded in a radio signal. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to one and only one type of cause. And that type of cause is intelligence, or mind, or rational and conscious activity. And so the discovery, I've argued in my books, that at the foundation of life we have information, that information is running the show in cells, and, the, and further discoveries that in the periodic intervals throughout the history of life, we have new big infusions of information. These discoveries in biology, I argue, provide compelling evidence for the activity of a designing intelligence in the history of life. Not just the appearance of design, the illusions of design, but actual intelligent design. 
Now, as a result of all these things I've been talking about, a number of commentators, historians and philosophers of science in particular, have, have noted that the God idea, the God hypothesis, is back. One historian, Frederick Burnham, says the idea that God created the universe is a more respectable hypothesis today than at any time in the last 100 years. And when I survey the evidence that we've just looked at, I, I not only agree, I think he's understated the case. I think theistic, the theistic worldview with its affirmation of a transcendent intelligent agent, namely God, provides a better explanation for the evidence that we've been looking at than the materialistic worldview or any other worldview that I've examined. What have we seen? We've seen evidence for a transcendent cause of the universe itself, and evidence that the universe had a beginning. We've seen that there's evidence for the design of the universe of, as a whole, the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics present from the very beginning of the universe, providing evidence that that, that transcendent cause is also intelligent. And we've also seen that there's evidence of a designing intelligence acting in the history of life. So we're not dealing with a deistic creator. We're dealing with an agent that has the attributes that Jews and Christians have long ascribed to God. Transcend, transcendent, uh, sorry, transcendence, intelligence, and an active concern for his creation, infusing information, creating at, at, at periodic times throughout the, the history of the universe. That sounds to me like the theistic conception of God. And so I conclude, as I look at the scientific evidence, that Richard Dawkins is wrong, and St. Paul in the book of Romans is actually right. Thank you very much.